do something a little different for a back backdrop this time, just to keep my room and such out of the picture. Um, in any case, you're gonna snazzy things up somewhat. This issue, we have the qualifiers for the 1997 Nintendo Power Awards, as we covered Nintendo Power issue 106 for March of 1998. I do apologize for the delay of this episode. I did want to be caught up on Next Gen Magazine before I covered this issue, as we are pro coming up on the end of this year of Nintendo Power, and I want to be ready for when we need to do the recap, the annual recap. Uh, as far as like, the end of each Nintendo Power Year recap of what else is going on in the game industry. Additionally, due to some technical issues, um, I wasn't able to capture gameplay for this on my actual N64, so instead I had to use an emulator and a USB N64 controller, which does have some stiffness in the analog sticks, which impacted play. Our cover game for this issue is 1080 Snowboarding. In the letters column, we get some sugar for WCW vs. NWO World Tour and for Diddy Kong Racing. In the power charts, Arrow Fighter Assault flies onto the charts for the N64. We start off with our cover game this issue, 1080 Snowboarding, an extreme sports game for the N64, when one developed by Nintendo themselves. There are notes on the gameplay modes, writers, and boards in the game, along with some control combinations for the tricks and notes on the tracks. 1080 Snowboarding is a strong downhill extreme sports racing game, though the issues I was having with the analog stick on my USB N64 controller, as I start the show, caused some issues with the controls. I wasn't able to get the degree of smooth movement from the analog stick that I suspected would have gotten on a proper console or a proper N64 controller, which meant that I had some issues taking part of the game and with pulling off some of the game's tricks. That said, the game does have a good feel within the game itself, hands-on with the controls and with how it looks and is presented and that sort of thing. I particularly appreciated the game accounting for different levels of snowpack, being able to move more quickly on heavier compacted snowpack while running into issues when going through deep fluffy snowbanks. The N64 is finally getting an RPG with Quest 64. Can this finally be the thing for loyalists who held off buying a PlayStation we're waiting for? No. No, it's not. It is, now this article is mostly a preview covering the game's mechanics and magic system, so I'm going to hold off on reviewing this until we get a bit more coverage, but get ready for disappointment. We have a new version of Rampage with Rampage World Tour with notes on all the various new mechanics. Not to put a fine point on it, but Rampage World Tour plays like Rampage, but with better graphics, digitized 3D character design models, and or not just our three lizards, but also for the backgrounds and that sort of thing. The World Tour side of things doesn't quite pan out. I don't get a sense, once we get out of the US and the UK, for example, that we're in UK locations that feel like the UK. Oh, there's a castle this one level. There is like a standing stone, which I guess is meant to imply Stonehenge, but I can't do anything to it. Um, there's no sense of like, oh, we're like trashing national monument monuments or landmarks or that sort of thing. So it ultimately, like other Rampage games, this plays best with multiple players comp where you and your buddies are competing for the best score and the most destruction. In the classified information column, we get a bunch of entertaining codes for San Francisco Rush. Some useful, some just fun, and some to um the difficulty. Next is a claim doing a take on a more simulationist hockey game with NHL Breakaway 98. There are notes of the gameplay modes and a list of the teams. NHL Breakaway 98 plays quickly, smoothly, and legitimately feels fun. Now, I don't feel as competent at it as I've felt with some other hockey games, and some of the control mapping choices feel a little counterintuitive. That said, it does a good job of keeping the, move the game moving smoothly, giving me a sense of what I need to be doing in any particular moment. I just wish I had better communication with the players were so I can better target my passes, and I wish I had a better sense of how to measure the power of my shots so I can try and take a moment, if I'm in the open, to line up a a stronger shot to try and blast it past the goalie. 
Next, we have Quake, id's follow-up to Doom, which, as people who've been reading my X-Gen recaps on the blog will note, has already gotten a sequel on its own at this point with Quake 2. And um, so it has been ported to the N64. There are notes in the power-ups and notes and maps for some of the levels. The N64 version of Quake feels more valuable as a historical curiosity than as the ideal way to play the game. At the time the game came out, the optimal way to play it, and by the game, I mean original PC Quake, the optimal way to play it required fairly high-end graphical hardware with a fancy 3D accelerator card. Nowadays, you could probably just play it on a Chromebook natively, not streaming, and it'd still look better than it did on the best possible computer when the game launched. I don't hate this version of the game, but I don't love it either. The controls are clunky, but the graphics feel right for the time, and ultimately it's, it's still Quake. Quake is a good game. It was a good then, it's still good now. It's classic Quake with all of its strengths and all of its weaknesses, but not without any of the necessary refinements that came with the more recent high definition ports or adjusting it to play with a dual analog stick control. So I can't hate it too much, but I can't truly praise it. We have some more maps for Yoshi's story to hype an upcoming player's guide. I've already reviewed Yoshi's story, so let's move on. Konami has returned to licensed sports games once again with NBA in the zone 98. I will note that while in, re in real life, Jordan is on the Bulls at this point. He's not in this game, and this is before Jordan's second retirement. Now, the Blazers do have Rasheed Wallace, um, but this is before Pippen had been traded to the Blazers, because again, Pippen was traded after Jordan's retirement. Now, with NBA in the Zone 98, I ran into a weird control issue. I could move with my analog stick even with all of its stiffness issues, in perfect eight-way movement when I was controlling a player who did not have the ball. However, if I was controlling someone who had possession, no matter which player that was, I could only move in four directions, which was tremendously clunky, to say the least. Ultimately, I did kind of find a way around it, which was one that was likely the, the designer's plan, to encourage the player to pass the ball around a lot. But still, it's kind of messy, and something that not a lot of other basketball games do in terms of restricting the ball holder's movement in this way. We have a preview of the game adaptation of the Brian De Palma Mission Impossible movie, mainly focusing on the game's first level. I want to hold off of this for um, next time, just to make sure. Because we'll probably get a more extensive guide later. Next up, we start moving into the Game Boy games with Wario Land 3. Wario is, I guess, finally truly gotten his own franchise proper besides the like the one Game Boy game and then the Virtual Boy game. So we have the premise for Wario Land 2. His castle has been burgled and Wario needs to get his stuff back. We get maps and notes for several levels. Wario Land 2 is great. The controls are intuitive, responsive. The graphics are easy to follow with environments that are breeze to navigate. The sprites are expressive and large without taking up too much screen real estate. The difficulty is balanced well in terms of damage that Wario takes and how that damage is expressed within the game. It's honestly one of the best games released for the Game Boy, period, and really fits with Wario as a solid rival for Cur with Kirby for the crown of best introductory platformer that isn't a Mario game. The challenge is balanced tremendously well, and getting defeated at the game doesn't feel catastrophic. That said, actually, it's the frustration, I would say, is less with this game and more with the overall big picture usage of Wario as a character by Nintendo. Like, at this point in the year of the common era, 2023, with how the Wario family has gotten such a tremendous fan base, how active, uh, yes, I guess the character is still active in sports games and WarioWare, 
but we haven't gotten a Wario platformer in so long. I'd love to see a new one. I'd love to see Nintendo take the lessons they learned in designing 2D or uh, 2.5D games in modern game design from the new Mario, new Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario Wonder series and that sort of thing and make a new Wario game. Like a new Super Mario Land, new Super Wario Land, or something like that. Be great. In Council's Corner, we have some questions on the secrets of Diddy Kong Racing and the boss fights in Arrow Fighter Assault. We're coming up at the end of this year of Nintendo Power, so it's time for the nominees. My picks are for Diddy Kong Racing, best graphics for uh, GoldenEye 007, since they got a whole bunch of nominations that I think it was worth winning or is worthy of winning. Uh, best Sound, Best Story, Best Rumble Pack, and Best N64 Game, along with Coolest Ride for the Russian Tank, and Best Hero for Bond, James Bond. For Most Innovative, Harvest Moon, Best Challenge, Blast Core, Best Play Control, WCW vs. NWO World Tour, Best Sports, FIFA 98, Best Party Game, Bomberman 64, for Creative Chaos, Destroying the Tokyo Tower in Era Fighters Assault. Coolest Code, No Radar, which I believe is also a Golden Eye 007 one. Best Villain, Andros. Best Item and Weapon, The Shrinker. And the Golden Bandage Award for Nasty Injury is getting two headshots. Um, most annoying thing in a game is rolling your car in Top Gear Rally. And finally, for the Best Game Boy and Best SNES categories, uh, best Game Boy game goes to Mole Mania, and Best Super Nintendo game goes to Kirby's Dream Land 3. Wrapping things up with a couple more last Game Boy games. We have, I believe, our last Game Boy, original Game Boy that is, Castlevania title, with the series' first female lead with Castlevania Legends. The article has the game's level order and notes on the two difficulties and some level maps. Castlevania Legends looks at the Castlevania Adventure games and goes, what if we tossed in the most unfair part of Super Mario Brothers The Lost Levels into this game? And the controls themselves are generally okay. They're solid Castlevania games. The music is good. Some nice variations on Blood and Tears for the first level. And the game does some useful quality of life steps like starting you after a continue on the last room you entered rather than making you play the level over. How, and this is on the, the default normal difficulty. However, the game doesn't really have any of the sub-weapons that you'd expect in the game. Like, I took out most of the candles in the first level and never saw a drop of a different sub-weapon either, even though I collected a lot of hearts. Uh, going some research, apparently you get sub-weapons by beating bosses and sub-bosses, which means what exactly am I doing with those hearts in the first level unless they carry over to the second? And this actually leads to the other issue. The game has trap candles. It's the innovation, it's innovation in scare quotes, that it takes from Super Mario Brothers of the Lost Levels and from the Poison Mushroom. In this case, trap candles are ones where if you whip the candle, the floor drops out from under you and you fall into a pit full of zombies. Now, supposedly, again, going from research, if you kill about 30-ish zombies, you get out, but the area is so confined and so little room for movement that I found it tremendously difficult to clear space for me to get through alive. It's a disappointing final outing from the Ca Game Boy Castlevania games, and for all, in spite of all their weaknesses. Uh, it's still like this game looked like it was almost a step in the right direction. So, unfortunately, just two steps forward, one step back, or perhaps one step forward, two steps back. In any case, I'm looking forward to the release of the Game Boy Advance so I can play a portable Game Boy ga um, Castlevania game that is a little more enjoyable. We have a Game Boy port of Bust a Move 2, so let's see how this puzzle game, Bricker Puzzle Matching Game, fares in monochrome. As mentioned earlier, this Game Boy fo this gameplay footage of Bust a Move 2 is being recorded in an emulator on a 4K monitor, zoomed in or blown up considerably. And if I wasn't wearing my reading glasses while I was playing, I would have had to strain my eyes to tell some of these different types of pieces apart. I appreciate the developers trying to make it clear, playing in monochrome, what the differences are between the various pieces by having little shapes inside. But honestly, this screen is just too small for the job. 
Nintendo Switch size with normal um, bubble bobble, uh, puzzle bobble sized um, well, bubbles? Sure. But the small, fuzzy, monochrome OG Game Boy screen? Not a chance in hell. Now, we have once again no also rans of the now playing column this league. In the pack watch, Zelda 64 has its subtitle as Ocarina of Time, and we have a look at Turok 2. My pick for this issue is Wario Land 2. That game really got me digging Wario Land as a game franchise and really made me wish we were getting more Wario games now that we that Wario Land had gotten has gotten a similar revival to go with the cult meme popularity of Wario and the Wario family as a character. I think it could have made for a really interesting, can make for a really interesting game series to have something where you have the different Warios with our own stats or movement mechanics or that sort of thing. And that would have been wonderful to play. As far as the N64 goes, um, nothing really grabbed me this time. Um, I do wonder if like Kennedy snowboarding played better if I was playing it on with a proper controller with less stiffness than the analog stick. Um, because I that would that and Quake were like the two games where I felt like the what was holding back on my enjoyment was the analog stick on the uh, on the USB N64 controller that I was using, and that on the proper N64 I would be having quite the same issues. Um, that said, there are so many better ways to play Quake now than the N64 version. You have like if you have Game Pass, you have Quake. Not just not only have Quake, you have Quake in HD with ray tracing and all sorts of other wonderful stuff to make it a much more playable and enjoyable experience. If you want to do it, play the game in that way. I and the I'm, like. I appreciate that this version of Quake exists and is available, and you can get it a used cop cartridge or play an emulated version if you are interested in playing N64 Quake as basically historical curiosity to look at the evolution of first-person shooters and particularly id first-person shooters on consoles because you can definitely like feel like how the, the, the progression of how these games control coming to consoles i dig that but like again as far as recommending this as being a idea, a not just ideal, but a good way to play Quake on, on PC, on Xbox, on Switch, on PlayStation 5, 4 or 5, there are just better ways to play Quake these days and play it with like just anything with a, with a dual stick controller for one for movement and the strafing and one for aiming in and of itself works terrifically or playing it with stick for movement um and then shoulder using both shoulder buttons for strafing something like that with like, we have better options for how to play quake these days next week um we have more uh basketball including um the late kobe bryant Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.